Welcome back to FranchiseOrders.com, uh, another segment. Uh, this is no offense to everybody else that I've interviewed thus far, going to be my favorite. As you guys can see, uh, this is definitely going to be a little bit of a uh, different video here. Uh, I have a beer, uh, I have uh, wonderful Cajun food, and I have my very good friend Scott Taylor, uh, President and COO of Walk-Ons, uh, with me here today. What's going hey, Scott, on, how's it going, man? Good to see you, buddy. Thanks for having us. Uh, we had uh, quite, a, uh, quite a trek here from uh, Houston, Texas today. Uh, but really, really excited to uh, to be here uh, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, uh, home of probably my favorite food in the entire world. So yeah, it should absolutely. be uh, pretty awesome. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, thank you for joining us. Really sure. appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, for, for folks who have not listened to one of these videos before, uh, main goal is to really have somebody like Scott come on the show just to really discuss uh, how to really better, how, how to really ensure that you're not going to make the same mistakes that maybe Scott may have made in the past and things of that nature, uh, helping the emerging and re-emerging franchisors to do just that. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's get started, Scott. Uh, just to, uh, I would love to just begin by talking about, I, I know that you guys had a really awesome story. If you guys can you know, see in the background, there are, there's a lot of sports going on here. I mean, there's Drew Brees and there's the founder, Brandon, who was a walk-on, which is how you got the name yep. uh, from, from LSU. Um, I know that you guys uh, definitely had a really tough time trying to determine who to hire first. And so I guess my question was, uh, where did you guys begin to build out in order to grow the way you wanted to? So it was fun. You know, I, I, you know, the concept started in 2003. Jack and Brandon, great guys. They knew how to throw a party um, and, and uh, had a great concept. Food wasn't great early on. And we had a great location here by LSU. And, and things just kind of progressed over time. But the, the thing that was great about those guys and it's great about Brandon today is he just wants to be great. If you can help us get better, let, let's get involved. So they worked with different consultants over the years. I came on as a consultant in 2010 and then uh, joined the company in 2011. And so mm -hmm. really at that point, we had pizzerias, we had Irish pubs, we had a nightclub, we had walk-ons, wow. and uh, but we had no systems. We just had cool brands that were doing really good, but weren't scalable. So the first thing was really kind of cleaning up systems and cleaning it up and, mm -hmm. uh, and getting it going. And we opened a couple of restaurants in 2011 too. Nice. And so what would you recommend for folks who are, um, I guess, who have a system that they really love and they adore, but they don't necessarily have a lot of scalability to it? What was one of the first things that you did that you thought was super helpful or to change it to make it what you guys are today? Sure. So I, I think it was just defining what we do. So there mm -hmm. was a uh, there was a lot of great things going on, but mm -hmm. you could ask three different people and they'd give you a different answer as to what we did or why we did it. And sometimes even down to specifications on the food. So we just went back and defined every single thing, the walk-on's way, we call it the wow. And so, you know, that part, once that was done, then we felt we could grow with our own stores. But one day if we wanted the franchise or bring in partners that they could do what we do and have all the tools. Absolutely. To and I think that that's incredibly important. Yep. You know, there's a lot of brands, especially in, in the food space, and luckily they had somebody such as yourself who was experienced that knew where to go, that, you know, they, they can't think of everything because they don't necessarily know how to scale it because they're baby. Right. So yeah, I, I think it's definitely good. They're lucky they had you. So that's always great. It's fun. Um, so I know that you definitely were there in the beginning uh, when you guys began to start franchising, uh, just in regards to uh, your selection process and how that's evolved over time. I'm sure that it definitely has. Um, what would you say, um, you know, what, what would you say your selection process was like back then? How has that changed uh, now? So, you know, I had come from a franchise system where we, we had grown very fast and brought a lot of franchise partners mm -hmm. that uh, I think our vetting process was more financial than mm -hmm. looking at the individual. And the culture is always so important here. And so I think Brandon's fear, you know, excitement about franchising, my biggest fear is like bringing in people that we didn't get along with. It didn't sync with our culture. And, mm -hmm. and we're a very social brand. We have a bar in our office for a reason because we drink at it. I thought you were uh, kidding you know, when you no, were like, oh, people will, have, will look, drink. And I was like, oh, no, he's not kidding. Behind, you know, we like to have a good time. Luckily. So if we're going to partner with people. Yeah. We like the people we want to hang out with and, mm -hmm. that have the same values, believe in our culture. And so that was really important early on. And, and I feel we've been pretty successful selecting people that, once again, we like to hang out with, mirror our culture and Sure. Yeah, it's been good. And and I guess my follow-up question to that is, is what do you feel that you've learned from those first few people? Because I think that it's really important. The first 10 people, you know, are obviously, and we, you guys hear this again and again and again, if you've watched multiple uh, videos of ours uh, thus far, but the first 10 are super important. What would you say is really the, I guess, the largest lesson you learned from those first 10 franchisees? I think, you know, the excitement about the brand and allowing people to 
take on more than they probably should have in the beginning. We had franchisees. Our first area developer bought 10, the rights to 10 locations. Mm-hmm. I mean, opening one restaurant, one walk-ons is a lot. 10, you know, in a market today with ground leases and the cost and things involved, I think we just, you know, we probably should have said, hey, let's do one. Let's yeah. do two, you know, and not 10. So I think we've we've gone back now and said, hey, let's let's not do these big area developments. Let's scale it back and let them grow into the areas that they want to be. Absolutely. Great. Uh, so on the topic of, uh, you know, your franchise offering just in general, um, the restaurant space is incredibly competitive, as we know. Um, you know, we go to the multi show and we see each other there and things of that nature. And, you know, it's there's a lot of different brands that are there. Uh, and I guess my question is, is how do you guys uh, find a way to differentiate from all of those other folks? Sure. So, I mean, looking around here, we're not in one of our restaurants, but we are a sports sports bar. Yeah. This is legit food in front of you. So take the TVs out. We're a legit South Louisiana restaurant. So you put those two together, great food, mm-hmm. this environment, not a culture that really involves, you know, that walk on mentality where it's team before self. It's the name on the front, not on the back. Absolutely. You know, our, our teams kind of have a chip on their shoulder. We, you know, we're not supposed to belong here. We're not supposed to be great, but we are great. Uh, mm-hmm. But at the same point, we're not arrogant. We want to get better every day. I used to tell the team, hey, we suck less today than we did yesterday. We're never going to be great. You know, <laughs> but at some point, you know, there's, there's a, there's, I think the difference between good and great is in the details. We really focus hard on the details, but we're really, really good. And, uh, but it's the food, it's the culture, and it's just this concept of game day with a taste of Louisiana. Yeah, absolutely. And for those who obviously can't smell the food because they're listening and watching and not here in general, I'm I'm kind of sad that I can't eat it right now. Yeah, so I really understand. On, those I really I really understand. So I mean, I I think that that's definitely a good place to really differentiate for sure. And I think that um, in addition to that, I know that you guys uh, obviously do differentiate from a consumer standpoint as well. So I guess I am really curious: is that do you feel that 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 the way you guys differentiate is similar for both? You know, from a franchise development perspective and from a consumer perspective, or is there a different edge to that? Um, I think it's I think it's very similar. So you know, once again. We're a sports bar, but and, and sometimes we, we don't like to say that because if we get put in the same group with the sports bars or the places you go to drink, and if you get really, really hungry, you might eat something. Our customer comes in to eat first, and the sports is land yet. You yeah. know, they come in, it's, it's a good time, but you know, we're, there are as many women and families in our restaurant as there are guys sitting at the bar or seniors or grandma and her tennis club or whatever sure. it is. Um, that's reflective in our franchisees as well because they – they see this brand, how they use it, how they experience it, and it's something that's a lifestyle brand that they want to be part of because they they really relate to the culture and it's something they can be proud of. Yeah, we're definitely we're definitely going to talk about culture in a second because I think that one of the things that I walked in and said to you uh, the moment I did walk in because I had heard all amazing things about this office and I said to you, I was like, if I were to work for a franchisor, it would look pretty similar to this. Pretty fun I mean, spot. I think that it definitely, uh, it feels good to, go, to come into work every day at a place like this. So it yep. definitely makes sense that consumers would agree with that. Now, um, we're going to take a more serious turn here and kind of uh, discuss, uh, uh, get into the numbers a little bit. I know that uh, you guys obviously do have a really large footprint, so uh, unit economics are incredibly important. Yes. So uh, I'd love to just dive into that and really determine uh, how you guys actually uh, make that data actionable and what you guys do um, to actually become better based off of the numbers you have at your Sure, show. no doubt. So we focus, you know, play to your strengths. Our, our food has become our strength. If In 2003, if you're at walk-ons, it was our weakness. In fact, it was probably a deterrent. Mm-hmm. Um, today, we hang our hat on our food. It's amazing quality scratch kitchen food. And, we're, and our average unit volume is over five million bucks. Wow. I don't know many restaurants, especially in our space, they're even close to that AUV. And it's 80% food. And to give you and to give people context, what's the what's the investment for you guys? So anywhere from one, three to two, four, depending if you're doing conversions or you're coming out of the ground with it. Doesn't include the real estate, but sure. that's your your FF and E and your other expenditures, you know, from hiring your people to start up capital. But so to give folks a uh, an idea, that's a lot of money. So it's a lot of money, but you're doing good. a lot of volume. We're doing our hundred thousand plus a week, you know, so you've got to focus on top line. So from a business standpoint, we are a top line driven company. I think a lot of companies focus on the middle of the P&L, how can we squeeze labor? Hey, let's cut portions and see if we can drive the food costs down, trying to improve the bottom line. Uh, I can tell you in almost nine years, we've never cut a portion. We've never gone to a lesser ingredient. We've only amped up our portions or amped up the ingredients, and that's driven top line sales. People know when you cheapen things. And so focus on the top line drives the bottom line. 
Um, and then everything in between that, you know, the economic model works. This is a good yeah. model. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Um, so I want to dive into franchise sales a little bit um, because you guys have obviously had a lot of success in the past couple of years. I think that um, you guys have really grown quite a bit. And um, I guess what the folks are probably wondering, because, you know, they're seeing you guys around shows now and you guys are be- beginning to have a more you know, national profile, uh, is where your leads come from. Uh, I-, I think that that's obviously important. And, you know, how you're actually finding uh, these awesome franchisees that you guys have that are making $5 million AUV. Sure. Uh, people would obviously love to know um, how you guys find these people. So from a, from a social media advertising standpoint, we don't do any advertising. Mm-hmm. We're not on any lead generator uh, websites. We're not driving SEO. We're not pay-per-click on Facebook. Uh, we're out in the market, and we're always out in the market with our food. So mm-hmm. if you see us at a show, we're serving Provache Etouffee, Duck Nandui Gumbo. We're out in the bar, sometimes hanging out with your dad. Um, almost always. Go, almost always with your dad. <laughs> hanging out, but we're social. We're fun. People see what we're about. And by the way, come eat with us. And so those people socially see what the brand is, engage, and, and we meet a lot of people that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we're still a referral business. I mean, great customers, franchisee, refer friends, and and uh, that's that's how it's been. But our growth is paced. You know, I, if we really wanted to sell, we probably could have sold three or 400 commitments. No exaggeration. We're, I think, at 140, but we're trying to keep that 20 to 25 restaurants a year so that I can attend every opening. Brandon Landry wants to be at every single opening, and I think that's important for the franchisees, for the for the for the team to see that we're we're involved. One hundred percent, and I and I think that um, my follow up to that because I am kind of curious is that um, you guys definitely do, do seem to have a brand that has a lot of loyalty, and a lot of people uh, really do pay attention to what you guys are doing, and quite frankly, love love you guys. And I think that. Um, my question is: Is how do you guys? How have you guys found that you're able to turn that into, um, you know, that person becoming a franchisee within the store? What initiative do you guys have that you guys are kind of employing within the store to almost trick people into thinking, "Well, hey, I could run this thing." Sure. So I think you know it, it's interesting. We give everybody a path in our restaurant. So you know, an hourly team member coming in, you know, our training department has developed this blue chip program where they can learn that you're not just a fry person. You're a uh, you're a chef and you could eventually be a kitchen manager. You could be an operating partner. You could be a general manager for us. There's growth for that. That culture permeates to the customers as well, because our team is just so engaged in this culture. Um, it, it's got to be the right fit. I had, a, I had a phone call with a prospective franchisee today, and they're asking a lot of great questions, a lot of great financial questions, all important. But I was like, man, this is a lifestyle. The first thing you got to ask yourself, you want to get in the restaurant business. That's yeah. a big decision. Number two, you want to be in the franchise restaurant business. Number three, do you want to be a walk-ons franchisee? Let's get past those three because the other part, that's all easy answers. You can figure mm-hmm. it out. I can point you to a franchisee. But I think people get into things because it looks exciting. And the restaurant business, especially uh, that has a bar, people are excited about it. But most people only sat on this side of the bar and, and never worked that side of the bar. And it's, 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 it's a lot of work. Business. It's a lot of work. And mm-hmm. so we try to educate people as to what they're getting into. And once they're all in, they're all in and they're successful. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Um, so I think that you got, it's, it's very clear that your franchise sales process is uh, something that a lot of people would want to replicate. And I think that um, the number one thing that I'm mainly curious about, because you have this beautiful space, uh, is you know what your strategy is for Discovery Days and sure. what you guys do to, to utilize the space because it is so great. And your, as you mentioned to me, because I watch a lot of sports and to be honest, every single time I watch college game day, and there's something with there's something with LSU. They see here, there's all these screaming heads going out, going crazy in a walk-ons, and I figured out that that's right over there. Oh yeah, which absolutely. Is crazy. So you know, I would love to kind of hear what your strategy is for. So Discovery Days are really an immersion. You know, so we want people to come and meet our team, learn what we're about. We're very proud of our support system. Um, I think we had 33 people hired when we had six corporate stores, and no franchise restaurants. Uh, which I don't know any franchise system that does that. We Not invested me. heavily on the GNA. You know, Drew Brees on the wall helped funding it. Brandon, our other partner, Rick, um, said, guys, we're going to hire a lot of people knowing that it's going to come. But when that first franchisee opens up, they're going to get the same support the franchisee 100 got. So part of this discovery day for us is they come and they meet all these people, see what mm-hmm. they're all about, spend time. We have lunch with them. Ideally, they stay overnight. We take them out for dinner. We have drinks. We just visit and just make sure that it's a good cultural fit. We also uh, will disclose people with their FDD and all that, obviously, but we would not sign an agreement at Discovery Day. And that's 
clear before anybody comes here because we don't want that. I mean, they're having a good time. Right. Trust me, you're going to have a good time. If you, if you come to Baton Rouge and you hang with our crew, you're having fun. But you need to go home and think about it and, and do your due diligence. So I've woken up with a couple of headaches from hanging with you guys before, <laughs> yeah, so I understand. Yes. But I, without I would, an FTD in your Yes, your exactly. Pro, without an FTD so. in my pocket. So yeah. it doesn't necessarily even mean you need to be a prospective franchisee right. for that to happen. So it's right. definitely good. But, yeah, I mean, I totally... Um, can see why this would be an amazing space to have a discovery day. And I oh, yeah. think that we have fun. And I mean, sure, there's golf simulators, you got air hockey, you got papa shots, you got, I mean, there's stuff to do. And so we're having a good time. I think it's fun. also important. You, you said something that I think I really loved was that it's also really important to ensure that you're having fun and that you really feel like you can get along with that person. Cause you're going to be in bed with that person for however long the franchise it is a marriage. Be, so. It's a marriage. And so there's a business relationship, but this is, like I said, we're just, we're a social brand. We're a social company, and we've got to like each other. Yeah. And there's a lot of people with money. There's a lot of people that want to invest with you, but I don't like you. You don't like us. I mean, this, there's we probably shouldn't be in business together. Absolutely. Understood. Well, thank you. Um, so I know that, I, as I kind of mentioned when I introduced you, the other half of your title um, is not just president. It's also COO. So you obviously do have a very large role from an operational standpoint. Uh, and I think that you probably would have a, re- a lot of really awesome things to say about, you know, tips and tricks that you may have to really, you know, have a good relationship with your franchisees. In addition to liking them, obviously, there is a business aspect, too. So 100 percent. So, you know, I think you've got to define what you're really serious about. You've got to define what the negotiables are. And uh, it's fun that as we brought folks onto our team here, you know, most of them had didn't have franchise experience. So you come from a corporate background out of cheesecake factory guy, I mean, black and white, you know, and, and franchising gray is actually a color. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so you got to go and you, you, you figure out these are the non-negotiables. I mean, food safety, we'll go to the mat. I mean, there's somebody not handling the food, right? We'll shut that restaurant down. I mean, it's a big deal, but does the salt shaker have to be on the right or the left? I mean, you kind of define the rules that gets the stress out of the way. And then, you know, I think just be transparent in everything you're doing from marketing to, you know, what operations people are looking at. I mean, there's no secrets. Uh, if you work that way, then you have a great relationship with your franchisees. Absolutely. Thank you. I think that that's certainly something that a lot of people will take as gospel because I think that that's one thing that we consistently hear. Uh, when, you know, when I'm talking to people in, in, in my daily job and I hear them always talking about like, I don't know what the damn hell to do when I'm talking to these people that, you know, have put their life savings with me. And, you know, I, I feel such a, it feels so much pressure and I don't really know how to do it. The right I think people aren't sure what to do. And you think about it, you know, for a walk-ons, whoever has amassed the wealth to open a walk-ons restaurant, isn't doing it to get a boss. So right. I don't want another boss. They're not working for us. We're a mm-hmm. partner. And so we're in this together. We look good together. We look bad together. So, Decision making on our end, we have to think about how this affects our franchisees, not about how it affects us first. And I think likewise on their end, if we do that, we're making great decisions and everybody gets along. Absolutely. And they're easy calls. You're not like, oh my God, this franchisee's calling. Who's no, just put it the voicemail. You just take the call. Absolutely. That's very important. I agree. So um, we have brought this up a couple times, but I think it's really important to define how you guys got there. Uh, when it comes to your culture, um, I think that it would be really cool for people to kind of understand the process that you and Brandon had when you guys really, um, you know, started to franchise this like really uh, extensively. I think it would just be really important for people to like, kind of understand how you got to the point that you guys are today. Because obviously there is such a culture. I feel like every single time that I um, hang out with you guys, I feel instantly more relaxed, which I think your franchisees probably feel too. So um, we'd love to kind of hear how you guys got to uh, the culture that you have today. Sure. So, I mean... <clears throat> Once again, we're in the hospitality business, and, and I think the franchise system. I was, uh, I was talking to a guy about a sure thing earlier. I said, "Open a Jiffy Lube, man, because that's like people need their oil changed, and it's a nasty job. Nobody changed their oil, but the restaurant business. It's uh, if Brandon was here, he'd say it's burgers and beer. You know, it, it's keep it simple, keep it lively, keep it fun, and uh, you know, we just have a good time. And I know I've said that a hundred times, but I do think that's where our culture starts. It goes from there to respect. Um, you know, we're going to have our annual planning session in October. Every single person in this office goes off-site with us for two days and works on a plan. We don't leave the receptionist here or maybe the administrative person. Everybody goes. We do a conference. Everybody goes because we're a family. And mm-hmm. um, I think it's important that, you know, respect. Everybody has a say. Um, we, we all realize that we're here to protect the W. 
like it says on the wall there. The W is what pays us. And so when we all realize we're aligned on one goal, that's where our culture just kind of flourishes. Absolutely. Great. Because I think that um, one thing that I see a lot of franchisors struggle with uh, over, you know, my many years of being a fly on the wall, maybe not actionably being a part of it, so to speak, but I think that just being around it, um, I, I feel that a lot of franchisors really, really struggle and they, you almost kind of feel like they're doing it because they know they have to, but they right. don't really feel like it. it's that as, as important as it should be. So you got to love what you do, man. There's, there's, life's too short to just have a job. There's so many places that make money. You got to love what you do. And I, I, speaking for the 42 other people that work here, I think they sure. love what they do. Um, we've had zero attrition. No one's left here. Um, you know, they have some that were going to college who graduated and some guy's an attorney now, but I think he'd love to still work here, but he's an attorney and that's kind of cool, you know, <laughs> but I mean, it's just people stay and people have uh, gone on to other careers from our restaurants and found their way to see how can I come work with walk-ons. It's Absolutely. Something special. That's very different. So definitely awesome. Um, and so... We're definitely going to take a turn here to something that may not necessarily be um, as uh, fun to talk about, but I think it is uh, really important for people to kind of understand uh, how, how, a, uh, how a larger franchise or such as yourself really deals uh, with things like this. But uh, there are a lot of threats, especially with the restaurant space. Uh, so would love to kind of hear, uh, you know, your guys' opinion or slash thought process as to kind of how you deal with things like minimum wage, how you guys deal with things of that nature and, you know, how um, you guys, what strategies you guys have in order to ensure that you guys are not only hitting your top and bottom line revenue in the right way, but also your employees are still uh, empowered too. Right. So, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a proponent of tip credits. I'm a proponent of servers delivering great service and that that position and that I was a server and a bartender growing up in college, and, you know, it, it was an opportunity to go out there and just blow people away and like, man, I can make a bunch of money. That's something about our hospitality industry, and I think trying to regulate it and you know, fifteen dollar an hour, you know, servers and bartenders is kind of tough. So uh, it's my opinion, but you know, we 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 educate, and so um, we're heavily involved in the restaurant association here, the International Franchise Association, mm -hmm. and just going through education. Um, I think the restaurant industry always gets a bad rap that you think about, uh, I worked in the restaurant space and I only did it till I could find a real job. Well, this is a real job mm -hmm. and it needs to have real pay, real benefits, real you know, deliverables for folks to, to want to be in this industry. So um, I think fair wages, it makes sense. Um, and then just the bigger part is just opportunity, man. You know, uh, we get all the best people. If you, if you ask some of the some of the most successful people where their first job was a lot of times it was in the restaurant industry and they mm -hmm. left and did something different if we just figure out how to keep those people man we'd be badass you know and no, so absolutely it's just i think that's the thing is man just keeping great people totally and i think that that is really what is important because i think that a lot of folks often forget um you know where they came from and i think that you that's know right. the restaurant space is where most of them come from i feel that's like right. a lot of the people that i listen to when i hear them sorry. speak they're just like oh like i was flipping burgers at mcdonald's or something like that and it always amazes me that they're sitting there with you know all this amazing jewelry and they're I, i'm captivated by what they have to say yeah. so i think it's it's cool to hear about that. that's awesome Awesome. So uh, to finish, because I know that, uh, you know, I've kept you here long enough and I know you got some kids to go back to and yeah. I uh, apologize for that That's again. Good. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that um, it's always my favorite question to ask is, you know, when you began uh, this journey of franchising, uh, I think that there are often a lot of things that you think back and say, well, 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 how I really wish I could take that back and not do it the way that I did then. Uh, what is one thing that you wish you could do differently when you guys first began to uh go down the road of franchise. So, I mean, it, it's funny. I, it, you know, Drew Breeze is a franchisee. So he was on board with us as we were putting our program together. And I remember sitting with him talking about his experience with his marketing fund. He's mm -hmm. like, I don't know. We, we give them money. We don't know what they do with it. We just do our own thing. It's like, wow. Okay. That's not good. You know, and, and I'd come from a brand where there was disconnects here and there. So I feel good about our franchisee selection. I think that putting the support on the front end was great, and then the selection was good. I think we got a little excited with franchisees and, yeah, mm -hmm. we can open 10 this market. You're going to open 15 stores because we liked it. We're like, we just got excited. I think, you know, we probably could have been more um, just temper our enthusiasm a little bit and just be realistic of what the expectations were for franchisees. But I'd say, man, no regrets. I think... Uh, we're strong. We feel good where we're at. 
Um, and uh, we just want to keep trying to make the right decisions and get a little better every day. Absolutely. Well, Scott, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I'm really excited now that we're done talking to, you know, to eat some food. hanging out a little bit it's and good. eat some of this awesome food. It's still warm. Thank you folks for listening. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, please uh, feel free to continue watching all the other videos that we have uh, here on franchisors.com. And uh, also, uh, also check us out on LinkedIn, uh, Ryan Hicks and Zach Fishman, and also on Facebook, uh, Ryan Hicks and Zach Fishman to follow along uh, with the rest of the tour and other things that are going on under the modern business umbrella. Thanks folks. And have a good day.